Hello, and welcome to our panel discussion, Space Law, Add an Intergalactic Dimension to Your Law Degree. My name is Andre, and I'm a third year Bachelor of Asian Studies and Law student. Today we'll be exploring what some might describe as the final frontier of international law, space. What is its geopolitical significance? What are the commercial and scientific interests? How can you study space law at ANU? Where can it take you in your career? The answers to these questions and more are coming up soon. First, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we gather. That's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people here in Canberra. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. Dr. Cassandra Steer is a senior lecturer at the ANU College of Law and, and the ANU Institute Space Mission Specialist. She is the host of the popular ANU Space Law podcast produced here at the ANU College of Law. And Joel Dennelly, for ANU Law alumni, he graduated here in 2015 with a Bachelor of Arts in Law, and he's currently a consultant at Accenture. Cassandra, I think it's appropriate to start with you because my own interest in space law sparked when you were my tutor for lawyers, justice and ethics. Firstly, can you tell us what space law involves and how you entered this really interesting field in law? Sure. So um, quite often you hear the expression that space is a wild west and a lawless frontier um, and nothing could be further from the truth. So we have um, international space law, which is made up of the five core space treaties. The, the key one is the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which is kind of like a constitution um, for everything that takes place in space. It sets down ground rules and core principles and values that were negotiated uh, in 1967. Um, and I call it a constitution because you want to think of it as a durable document because it contains those key principles. It doesn't regulate specific activities. Um, and as technologies change and as the different kinds of actors in space um, increase, we need to think about new kinds of laws and regulations, but we certainly don't need to change our constitutional outer space treaty. Um, but one of the key provisions of that treaty, Article 3, says that all activities in, in outer space must take place in accordance with international law. And so what that means is we have whole bodies of international law that apply in outer space, from the law of treaties, state responsibility, human rights, law of armed conflict, uh, environmental law. Um, so there is a lot of law that governs what goes on in space. Um, and then on top of that, because the Outer Space Treaty also says that states, countries, are responsible for everything that happens in space under their jurisdiction, um, and that every object in space maintains the jurisdiction that it, where it originates from, that means we have a lot of domestic or national space law as well. So, you know, Australia has its own space agency, we have our own space legislation, the US does, New Zealand does, the UK does. Um, so there's a lot of domestic space law as well that regulates much more um, specifically the kinds of activities and licenses that you need and insurance and contracts and a lot of things that belong to more traditional law than applied to the space sector. Mm, yeah, I think it's really interesting because it looks like space law is constantly developing and it underpins a lot of really interesting shifts in a lot of different industries and a lot of different institutions. Joel, I'd like to talk to you. As someone who is a great example of where studying space law can take graduates, can you share with us about your work and the opportunities that exist in the space industry? Yeah, of course, of course. Just very quickly, I just wanted to build on Cassandra's very important point about Article 3, which is that it's important to remember if you're interested in space law, that space law is a specialised regime of general international law. And if you want to understand space law, you need to understand international law more broadly. Specialised regimes are fine, they evolve, they contain rules that may govern how certain subjects of international law are, are regulated. They may differ from the general rules, but it's really important to remember that they are embedded in a much broader regime of custom and treaty law. I think Roberto Argo talked about the concentric circle model, this idea of that these pockets of specialised regimes may evolve, but it's really general international law that you need to understand because it forms the basis of space law. But in terms of um, opportunities here in Australia, so if you're interested in space law, think about what space law applies to because it will apply to various activities. Um, the Australian Space Agency has recently published a civil space strategy, so this is a 10-year strategy, and it's important to, to, to go onto their website and download and read this. In that document, they outline seven national civil space priority areas, and these are areas that Australia has 
uh, comparative of comp yeah, competitive advantage um, over other countries, and a lot of them focus on our unique geography. Uh, so in terms of opportunities in the Australian space sector, I would be researching things like the, the, the acquisition and use of position navigation and timing technology, um, earth observation uh, and the data that is collected from, from assets like satellites and how that data plugs into the wider economy. Uh, uh, launch as well is really important. So Australia is developing a domestic launch uh, capability and so we have a unique geography, a vast landmass, and so we can launch objects into outer space from the north of the country, which gets us into equatorial orbits, or from the south, which gets us into polar orbits. So look at look at uh, uh, launch as well. Um, I would also be looking at uh, space domain awareness, so the ability to identify, detect, track, uh, and catalogue objects in outer space, both human-made and, and naturally occurring. Um, other comparative advantages relate to robotics and automation, developing technologies that we can we can control from Earth, but which are potentially on 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 the moon, for instance. So so uh, you know long distances away. These are all the emerging areas that I would be looking into and thinking about. How does the law regulate this? It's really important to think about how the law regulates this. Um, also, have a little look at the recent uh, amendments that have occurred to Australia's legislation in 2018. The the current uh, body of Australian space law outlines various approvals uh, that relate to, to certain activities like launching objects, returning objects. So understanding Australia's domestic legislative um, regime is really important as well. Hope I've answered your question. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. It certainly sounds like it's a very high growth area and space law applies to a range of contexts. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to law, I'm studying Asian studies and I'm really interested to see how space applies to Asian geopolitics and Asian cultures. Joel, as someone that's currently studying the Masters of Data Analytics at ANU, I'll be really interested to know how data analytics has intersected with your background in space law. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm doing a, a Masters of Applied Data Analytics through the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and it's a fantastic Masters. It has three big components. There's a statistics component, a, com uh, a computation, a programming component, and then there's a, a policy component, how the data and the analytics are actually applied in real world settings. Um, and I, I did this because I, I realised um, a few years ago that assets like satellites are the vast majority of what human activities in outer space entail is, is satellite uh, activities. They, they make up a vast portion of everything that we do in outer space. And a lot of these satellites, one type of satellite is an Earth observation satellite, which captures images of the Earth in high resolution or in synthetic aperture radar. And these images are then downlinked to the Earth and we can analyze them. We can, we can plug them into different parts of the economy. They have direct application in things like precision agriculture. So farmers can use these images to know where to appropriately apportion uh, uh, um, fertilizer and water and things like that. So we can use these images to detect um, uh, refugee boats that may be lost at sea in order to alert Coast Guard and things like that. So there's some amazing use cases for capturing images in outer space, bushfire management, things like that. I realized though that I had such a low literacy uh, when it came to data and analytics and I needed to do something about it. So I enrolled in the masters here and it's given me a really deep appreciation of, of uh, how data collected from space is a strategic asset for Australia. It is so important that we are collecting this, this information uh, and that we are analysing it and we are gaining insights because ultimately we are doing this in order to improve decision making and performance across the economy. Uh, so I suppose that's how it intersects. Mm, yeah, and I really like how you talked about the importance of data literacy in the technology component of space activities and space law. Switching to the more human-centred side of things, Cassandra, I'll be really interested to learn and hear about your project with um, Indigenous governance in space law. So I think there's a fair amount of work, important work being done about recognising Indigenous cosmology and astronomy and mapping that onto Western astronomy uh, and recognising that as, as science. Um, but the law, policy and governance side um, is an area that is not yet getting enough attention. So there's two reasons that I'm very interested in it. Um, one is that 
almost all of our ground-based space infrastructure in Australia is on the Indigenous estate. So what's happening in space is not just the satellites, it's also the data that Joel mentioned and the, um, and the information that needs to be sent down from satellites. So there's the link between uh, space and Earth that's part of the space sector. And then the other segment is the ground segment. So you have um, satellites, tracking stations. When you receive the data, you need to analyse it uh, and turn that into um, visual information or whatever information people want from it. <clears throat> um, and almost, and, and, you, and there's also potential launch sites. We have three um, proposed launch sites, one of which has been licensed in South Australia, all of which is on the Indigenous estate. I mean, really everything in Australia is Indigenous country, but if we're looking at um, issues around native title, issues around um, cultural heritage protection, uh, and issues around um, Indigenous-led governance in terms of long-term sustainable management of the Australian ecosystem and of, and of, our, and of our landscape, we need to be doing a better job of engaging Indigenous Australians with those projects. So there are some companies that are doing really great outreach work, um, but it always remains contentious as to whose voices among Indigenous Australians are being listened to, um, and to what end and what purpose. So we need to ensure that there is free, prior, fully informed consent if, the, if these activities are on, um, on native title land. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're engaging with Indigenous Australians around ensuring that they have career pathways into the space sector, that they can benefit economically from these activities. Uh, and I think the government could be doing a much better job of learning lessons where it has been doing good outreach um, and applying that to the space sector. So that's one aspect. The other is, we have enormous problems of space governance, um, in particular if we think about the space environment itself and space debris. So there's about 3,500 operating satellites orbiting the Earth. That number increases every two weeks at the moment, but that's an approximation. There's about 128 million pieces of debris orbiting our Earth, everything from the size of a bus down to um, about one, one centimetre. That's an estimate because we can't track it all. There may be more and there's certainly very small pieces which are very hard to track. Um, so that goes to some of our, our capabilities in Australia and our potential um, to be world leaders in, in the space sector. But that's just, it's a huge problem that we keep adding to with more and more launches and it is completely unsustainable. So we need to think about our space environment as inherently valuable. It's part of our natural environment. And we also need to think about it in terms of we are so dependent on space-based technologies for our 21st century lives. Navigation, communication, um, our banking, our stock market, search and rescue, bushfire, all the things Joel mentioned as well. All of our military activities in incredibly dependent on space technologies. If we keep adding to that population of space objects and space debris, we're going to make it a completely unusable environment. So I think we have a lot to learn from Indigenous Australians who for tens of thousands of years have managed the environment for long-term sustainability and for intergenerational equity. That is built into their law and governance systems. So we should be, um, uh, I guess, white Australia should be doing a better job of engaging with Indigenous Australians in the space sector and our government and our companies should be listening to those Indigenous governance uh, mechanisms and methods and knowledge to improve how we're governing our space activities. Thank you, Cassandra, for sharing those really interesting insights, especially the Indigenous co-design considerations in making space activities much more sustainable. I want to come back to you and ask about your recent book. What are some of the key flashpoints in space for 2021? Yeah, so the book is called War and Peace in Outer Space, Law, Policy and Ethics. Um, and it's a collection of essays from leading experts around the world um, in, in each of those areas. Uh, and it's called War and Peace because we didn't want to focus only on questions of militarization and weaponization of space and the potential for conflict, although those are um, definitely flashpoints uh, and key areas that I focus on um, with, my, with my focus on space security. Um, but um, it's also about how to manage crises in space, how to reduce the risk of conflict, how to ensure greater um, collaboration, cooperation and communication in space, because those things are what are going to contribute to keeping space stable. 
uh, which we need to do because of how dependent we are on space. Um, so, you know, there's some chapters in there that look at the legality of anti-satellite weapons. There's a chapter that looks at the Space Force, the US Space Force, and what it should be doing. Um, there are ethical questions about whether countries should be seeking to dominate space because we see that a lot in uh, military doctrine um, uh, and in some policies from some countries. Um, and also what new entrants can do, what we can do in terms of thinking about safety zones in space. Uh, I've written a chapter about how the law of armed conflict applies in space. Uh, and there's some really important pieces about space diplomacy. Um, so it's, it's a book about space security um, writ large uh, and, and bringing perspectives from around the world. And I think it was published just at the beginning of this year by Oxford University Press. I think it's been an extremely timely publication because of all of the issues that you know, we're reading about in the news. Australia's just announced it's going to have its own space division. Uh, a lot of countries like Canada, Japan, the UK, France, they, Germany, they all uh, have their own space command. So we're seeing, um, we're seeing how important space is strategically, and we need to think about that from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really think it's really um, great how your book addresses a lot of the key tensions that will characterize the foreseeable future in the space law field. Joel, you are releasing a book soon about space. Would you like to share some of the highlight points of your Sure, sure. So the book has a, has a very boring academic title. It's called uh, Risk Management and Outer Space Activities, an Australian and New Zealand Perspective. So it's uh, myself and, and several colleagues. Um, we've written a book that looks at uh, what risks emerge in the course of undertaking certain space activities and how Australia and New Zealand have or might manage and control those risks. Um, so the, the first chapter sets out a, a framework for understanding risk in the space context and then each subsequent chapter um, outlines a, a certain topic related to risk management and outer space. So we have a, a topic on the recent changes to Australia and New Zealand's legislative regimes and how they act as risk control mechanisms. We look at insurance and how we can trend transfer risk, risk through space insurance. There's topics on varied case studies from space debris mitigation to cyber security risks in outer space, uh, risks associated with launch, even a topic on, even a chapter on light pollution as a risk to astronomical research. And so that will be published uh, in the next few months. Really looking forward to seeing it. ANU, this is a final question for you, Joel, and Cassandra, feel free to jump in. ANU is one of the only universities in the Southern Hemisphere where you can study space law, which is available to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. Joel, what would be your message to students considering to make space law part of their law degree, but are uncertain about how practical it is for them compared to, say, contracts or corporations law? Yeah. Uh, so I would say do study space law because there are opportunities in space governance law and policy um, outside the, the more traditional topics in space law, which is an analysis of the big five UN treaties. So think about it from the point of view that across uh, uh, the Australian government, there are a lot of departments that have space capability. We now have an agency, and in the agency there are legal officers, there are people tasked with understanding what our international obligations are and how our domestic legislation works. There's obviously job opportunities there from time to time. Think about the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. DFAT attends uh, one of the UN committees called the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It's a, it has a legal subcommittee which is responsible for the development of, of international space law. You've got the Department of Industry. The Department of Industry is responsible for integrating the space sector with the wider economy, creating linkages and developing that end-to-end -end supply chain. And so an understanding of space law is definitely important there. Um, then you've got obviously uh, the, the private sector, so the big law firms. Think about the, the, the clients that they would have. They would have aerospace clients that would require lawyers to have an understanding of not only contract law but also space legislation here in Australia. And then of course, and I'm not the expert here, but of course academia. Yeah, so um, the course that uh, we offer here at ANU College of Law, uh, it's a new course. It's called Space Law and Governance. Uh, and it, you're right, Andre, it's unique in Australia. Um, there is no other course like it in Australia. In fact, we have some students enrolling cross institutionally from three other universities in Australia seeking to do the course. Um, some people from defence and some practising lawyers are also joining that cohort of undergrad and grad students. Um, and I think that demonstrates that it, you know, the time, the, 
the time is ripe in Australia. People are seeing it's a new sector. Um, everything that Joel just mentioned, in fact, you need a grounding in public international law. You need a grounding in contracts. You need a grounding uh, in commercial law. Um, you need a background in those core subjects of law uh, in order to understand space as a particular sector. Uh, and it's a growing sector. Um, and it's a sector which involves a lot of different interests. So we've mentioned the indigenous governance, uh, the commercial space sector, um, space security, so defence as well. There are whole career pathways in, in defence. And academia, indeed, um, there are crossovers, and I hope to build this course out in years to come to become a cross-institutional course as well, because we need people who are thinking about governance, sustainability, uh, international relations, uh, Asia-Pacific in particular. Um, so the course itself covers a range of those issues. Uh, it attempts to give um, a deep enough introduction into how all those issues are inter interrelated. Um, and in the future, next year, I'm going to be offering some micro-credentials and professional development courses. And I hope to see um, the opportunity to develop a series of master's level, called level courses because each of those subject areas and the issues we've touched on has so many uh, interrelated and interlinked uh, questions uh, and, and themes that need to be dealt with. Yeah, awesome. Th again, thanks for um, really like strengthening the importance of space law in covering a range of domains. And I think it's really great to see ANU College of Law playing such a engaged role in nurturing great understandings of space. And finally, can you confirm that the superhero we deserve in the next Star Wars movie will be a space lawyer? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I understand how um, astrophysicists uh, and scientists must feel when they're watching sci-fi and they're seeing absolutely impossible scenarios playing out in front of them. Um, when I watch movies like The Martian uh, or some episodes of Star Trek or Star Wars and things that are just plain incorrect about the legal situation as stated, I find it very frustrating. Um, so that may even be a career path advising the entertainment industry as to space law and policy on future sci-fi. Um, but as to a superhero space lawyer, look, it's certainly one of the um, vocations that are going to be needed in future, future human uh, exploration. Only time will tell. Thank you, everyone, for your insights and this really stimulating discussion. Don't forget to look in the links in the description of this video to learn more about the various opportunities to study space at ANU. Thank you.